we are working on geometry end of course review. So this video is going to uh, review a variety of topics. Um, just scrolling through here, we've got the equation of a line through a particular point. We'll be converting this uh, equation of a circle into standard form. We'll be par partitioning a line segment. We'll be talking about the properties of uh, special quadrilaterals, and uh, we may even go into um, the sector area of a circle and other things like that. Okay? Just scrolling through to give you a quick glance of all that is to come. All right. But we're going to start with problem number 36. What's the equation of the line that goes through the point negative 2 comma 2 and is parallel to this line that's given here? I like to break this down into a three-step process. In fact, I think I'll zoom in a little bit more. Because here's what I like to do. I like to make a little chart out of it where I say um, in the first column I do slope m. In the second column, I do the y-intercept, b. And in the third column, I write the equation. Of course, the equation is always of the form y is equal to something times x plus something, where the first box is the slope, and the second box is the y-intercept. Okay, now, um, they gave us a parallel line. Parallel lines have the same slope, so they gave me the slope of a parallel line, I'll call that m parallel, and the slope of this line is negative one-half. Okay, so because the slopes of parallel lines are the same, then the slope of the line that I'm trying to find an equation for will also be negative one-half. So this is the slope we're going to use. And in fact, we can go ahead and write that down in the first box, negative one-half. Now it's time to find the y-intercept. All right, for that we use the model y equals mx plus b, and um, we know that uh, because it passes through this point, that gives us an x and a y. So y is 2, m is negative 1 half, x is negative 2, and then plus b. So b is the y-intercept that we're trying to find. So 2 is equal to, um, so this is going to, a negative times negative is a positive, and this would be like 2 over 2. So that's just 1. And then if I subtract 1 from both sides, I get 1. So that's B. Whoa, that was weird. Um, so that means, uh, I almost wrote B again. Um, that means this B value is 1. So that means the equation is Y is equal to negative 1 half X plus 1. So that would be the answer. All right, so the answer is A. Okay, moving on to number 37. Take this equation and write it in standard form. So um, there's a couple things I'm gonna do. One thing I need to do is uh, I need to move this 66 out of the way. I'm going to wind up subtracting 66 from both sides. Um, also, I need to reorganize this equation so that the x terms are together and the y terms are together. So watch for me to do both of those things. Okay, so um, when I rewrite this, putting the x terms together, I will have x squared minus 18x. Okay, and I'm going to leave a little space right here. 
then I'm going to start with the y term. So that's going to be plus y squared, all right, plus 14y. Okay. And again, I'm going to leave a little bit of space. You'll see why in a minute. And then because I subtracted 66 from both sides, I will have negative 66. So this is how we begin. Now, we're doing something called completing the square. So looking at this first part right here, this is a trinomial. It looks like a binomial, but we're going to fill in the third number in a moment. So this trinomial can be written as a binomial squared. So how do I get this binomial? Well, I see the x, so I'm definitely going to have an x. I see the minus sign, so I'm definitely going to have a minus sign. The number is just going to be half of this. So that's going to be 9. OK? Now, um, the th third term in the trinomial, I need to fill that in right now. Well, that's just going to be negative 9 squared. Like if I ignore the x, see how it's negative 9 squared? Um, that is positive 81, so I put plus 81. Now that changes the equation though, um, so I need to balance that out by putting plus 81 on the right hand side as well. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing with the y's. This trinomial can be written as um, y plus 7 squared. Okay, again, the 7 came from half of 14. Um, but once again, I need to um, complete the square by filling in this, uh, the constant, the third term in the trinomial. And if you ignore the y, I have 7 squared. That's 49. So that's the number that completes the square. And again, I must put plus 49 on the right-hand side as well to balance out that change. Okay, so what I have now is x minus 9 squared plus y plus 7 squared is equal to, and I need to figure out what this, what this is. So I can use a calculator to help me out. Let me just move this over a bit. Negative 66 plus 81 plus 49. That's going to be 64. Okay, so that is the standard form equation. x minus 9 squared plus y plus 7 squared is equal to 64. Okay, x minus 9, y plus 7. Oh, this is the only one that has 64. So the answer is definitely B. Okay, it's very nice of them to make them all x minus 9 and y plus 7. I guess we didn't even have to worry about that. But the 64, though, that's the key. Anyway, let's move on. All right. Um, let me zoom out. Okay, for number 38, we are given these two endpoints. We need to find the point that partitions the directed line segment GE into the ratio of 3 to 1. Okay, so first of all, you see this 3 and this 1. Okay, um, remember that we are partitioning the segment GE. All right, so I have G over here, and I have E over here. Um, 3 plus 1 is 4. Keep that in mind, uh, because that's going to give me two fractions. I'm going to have 3 fourths, and I'm going to have 1 fourth. Okay, watch out for that. All right, so this tells me that I'm, gonna, I'm going to be either... Uh, 3 fourths from G or 1 fourth 
from E. Okay, the 3 fourths goes with the G, the 1 fourth goes with the E. Now, what do I mean by that? I'm glad you asked. Let me show you. Um, so let's just draw a schematic. Actually, you know what? I'm going to have to zoom in a little bit more. Um, because we have X's and Y's, so what I really need to do is I need to, uh, I need to do two separate little problems. I need to do uh, the X's and the Y's really separately. So that's what I'm going to do. So over here I'm going to do the X values. And over here I'm going to do the Y values. Okay. So let's make a segment. Um, let's make a number line just using the X values. So I have X values 1 and 9. Okay, so that's going to be like this. All right, and this is 1 and this is 9. Okay, uh, you know, yeah, maybe I'll put it underneath. So this is 1 and this is 9. Because I also want to say that this is point E and this is point G. Okay, now um, I need to know and keep track of how far apart these are. All right, how far apart are 1 and 9? Hopefully you can see that these are 8 apart, all right, because 9 minus 1. All right, now um, I always like to go from left to right when I can. So because I'm going from E, um, I'm going to use this fraction over here, all right? Because we know we need to be one fourth of the way from E. Okay, so that's why I'm going to do this. I need to figure out what one fourth of the way is, because eight is the whole way. I want to go one fourth of the way. Well, one fourth of eight, um, that's eight divided by four, that's two. So two is one fourth of the way. So that tells me that I need to go 2 to the right, which is like plus 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. OK, so that is the x value of my answer right there. So now I'm going to do the same thing with the y values. OK, so let's look at these y values. Let's make a little number line. Okay, so my y values are uh, negative 7 and 5. So this is negative 7 and this is 5. Okay, and I, again, this is E and this is G. Okay, so I need to know how far apart these are. Um, these are a total of 12 apart. You know what I mean? Because somewhere in here would be like 0. You know, maybe the zero would be about here. Seven to the left, five to the right. That's a total of 12. So anyways, um, I always like to travel from left to right when I do these problems. So once again, I'm going from E. So I know I want to go one fourth of the way from E. So I'm, I need to figure out what that is. So what's one fourth of the way? Well, 12 divided by 4 is 3. So that tells me I need to go over 3 to the right. All right, I'm doing plus 3. So the question is, what is that? And that should be negative 4. OK, negative 7 plus 3 is going to put me at negative 4. So that is the y value of the answer. Okay, so putting those two together, the x value and the y value, that's going to be 3 comma negative 4. So that's why I know that the answer will be A. Here comes a loaded question. Which of the following quadrilaterals always have congruent diagonals? Well, really to answer this question, you need to have this whole chart in your mind. 
uh, I encourage you to pause the video and study this chart because everything on this chart is something that you need to know. All right, understand the organization here. It's almost like a Venn diagram. See how it says parallelograms right up here at the top? That's because everything to the left of this line, uh, all of these shapes are parallelograms. All right, a rhombus, a rectangle, a square, they are all special cases of parallelograms. So these uh, five properties up here that pertain to parallelograms, they pertain to all of these. And then in addition, we have um, kites and two different, uh, two different kinds of trapezoids. All right, the things that are listed in yellow are the definitions of each one. And then the things uh, in red are the special properties. Okay, so uh, this question about the diagonals, this would be a special property. So let's sort of scan through and see um, which of these uh, quadrilaterals have diagonals that are always congruent. Um, let's see, parallelogram, diagonals bisect each other. That means they cut each other in half. That does not mean they're congruent. So that's definitely not going to be true for all parallelograms. Um, let's see, rhombus, the diagonals are perpendicular. Um, you know, that, that, that's not the same as being congruent. The diagonals are uh, lines of symmetry, all right? That just means the diagonals will split the figure in half, okay? That doesn't mean the diagonals are congruent. Um, but then finally we get to rectangle. Aha! Diagonals are congruent. That's true for a rectangle, okay? Rectangle. Hmm, diagonals perpendicular, nothing about diagonals. Aha, diagonals are congruent, again. So these are the two shapes that have congruent diagonals, uh, a rectangle or an isosceles trapezoid. Those are the only two. So let's look at the list. Rectangle, all right? I see trapezoid, it doesn't say isosceles. So um, uh, from this list, the only one that will always have congruent diagonals is a rectangle. So the answer is C. Number 40, is EFGH a rhombus or not? Well, first of all, we need to know what a rhombus is. A rhombus is a quadrilateral with four congruent sides. That's the definition. So now we need to know, um, do we have four congruent sides? Well, the vertical sides, we can just count the squares. Okay, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, let me just double check. Two, four, six. So these are six and six. Um, so now we just need to, to check the, uh, the diagonal sides and see if they're also six. Uh, to do that, I like to use the Pythagorean theorem. So if I look at this horizontal distance, um, that's five. And if I look at this vertical distance, that's three. Uh, let me get these sixes out of my face. So I've got five and three. So if I were to use the Pythagorean theorem right now, okay, in order to find the hypotenuse, um, it would be, okay, so HE would equal the square root of five squared plus three squared. All right, just using that Pythagorean theorem. Um, I already know that this is not going to be six. It's going to be some decimal. But um, let me show you anyway. So five squared plus three squared. Okay, that's radical 34. All right. If it was going to be six, this would be 36. Uh, I meant to hit this button. Um, so that's like 5.8, approximately 5.8. It's not 6, um, so that tells me that I do not have four congruent sides. So is this a rhombus? Um, it's definitely not going to be uh, any of the yeses. Let's see, no, because the pairs of opposite sides are not parallel. No, because not all four sides are congruent. The answer is D. Okay, moving on to number 41. What is the area 
of the shaded sector. Okay, um, when we start talking about sector area, the first thing we should do is write down the formula. The area of a sector is always some fraction of the total area. Um, so the fraction is always going to be theta divided by 360. Okay, uh, I'll come back to that theta in a second. Um, of course, the formula for the total area is pi r squared. So the area of a sector is always some fraction of the total area. Now, what's this theta? The theta is the measure of the central angle, which is the same thing as the arc measure. Okay, um, let me pick a lighter color that I can draw in this shaded region. Okay. Um, so this is theta, whoa, that's too big. This is theta right there. But in this case, they gave us uh, the arc measure. You can tell that's uh, the measure of the arc because of the degrees. Um, if this was centimeters, then that would be the arc length, and that would be something different. Um, but theta is 144 for this problem. Okay. So uh, now I can substitute in what I know. So um, the sector area has got to be 144 over 360 times pi. Uh, and the radius was 7, as you can see. So pi r squared becomes pi 7 squared. OK, and really, I can just put all of that in my calculator. Now, let me see. Yeah, we got decimals and such. OK, so 144 over 360 um, times pi 7 squared. All right, that would be the exact answer if anybody ever asked me. Okay, 61.58. Got to round up. Um, so the answer is C. All right, so that was the sector area. On a circle with radius 100 inches, the length of a certain arc is 476 inches. What is the measure of that arc in degrees? Well, they gave us the arc length, all right? They said um, the length of a certain arc is. So this is the arc length. So that tells me that I need to use the arc length formula. Arc length is always some fraction, okay, of the, well, some fraction, so theta out of 360, of the total length of the circle also known as the circumference, which is 2 pi r. So this is the arc length formula. Now they gave us the arc length is 476. So 476 goes here. Um, they gave us the radius. Okay, 360. So 2 pi 100, they gave us the radius. And then they asked me for the measure of the arc, degrees. That's theta, OK? The arc measure is in degrees. Degrees, that's going to be theta. So it's just a matter of solving this problem. Um, so what I would do if I were you, I would start by multiplying both sides by 360, all right, to get rid of the fraction aspect of this. Okay, so that way these will cancel each other out. All right, these numbers are going to be a little bit big. So 360 times 476, that's um, 171,000. So 171,360 is equal to, uh, and then I have theta times. And I might as well go ahead and multiply 2 times 100. So that's going to be 200 pi. OK, now I'm trying to find theta. 
And this is really the last step. I just need to divide both sides by 200 pi. Okay, 200 pi. That way this cancels out and leaves theta by itself. So I'm just going to go 171,360 um, over 200 pi. All right, 272.73. So here you go, 272.73 degrees, the answer is D. Number 43, this track is made of a rectangle and two semicircles. Find the perimeter of the outer edge outlined in bold. Well, the first thing that's going to be really helpful to me is to identify the radius. So um, look at this circle, well the semicircle, what's the radius going to be? Um, you can probably easily tell that the radius is going to be 3 because over here we can see that the, that the diameter is 6 so the radius must be 3. Now, why do I need that so badly? Well, um, if the radius is 3 that means that um, if I draw the radius in this direction horizontally it's also going to be 3. All right, This is going to be necessary for me to figure out um, the length of the rectangle because um, this circle over here has the same radius, right, because it has the same diameter. So this will also be 3. So that's a total of 6. So if I take 6 away from 28, that leaves 22. That means that this portion, all right, this side of the rectangle right here is 22. Okay, um, that tells me that <clears throat> this portion of the rectangle over here is also 22. So um, when I add this up, uh, the perimeter, I need to find the sum of four things. I've got these two straight pieces, all right, and then I've got these two curved pieces, all right, these two semicircles. All right, I need to find the length of each one of these. In fact, let's do this. Okay, um, I'm going to call this length 1, and I'm going to call this length 2, and I'm going to call this length 3, and I'm going to call this, all right, I'm talking about the 22 here, I'm going to call this length Four. All right, it's these four things. The perimeter is going to be the sum of all four. We already know the length, uh, length three and length four. We need to now find length one and length two. All right, because uh, the perimeter is going to be just length one plus length two plus length three plus length four. So, what is length number one? Length number one is a semicircle. It's half of a circle. So, um, what's the circumference of the whole circle? An entire circle is 2 pi r. Okay, so that would be the length, the circumference of a whole circle. Um, since the radius is 3, that would be 2 pi 3, which would be 6 pi, all right? That's the circumference of a whole circle, all right? However, this is half of a circle, so I need to take half of 2 pi r. I need to take half of 2 pi 3. I need to take half of 6 pi. So that's going to be 3 pi. So length 1 is 3 pi. <clears throat> um, since length 2 has the same dimensions as length 1, um, length 2 is also 3 pi. So if I want to find the total perimeter, I need to add up 3 pi plus 3 pi plus 22 plus 22.
<clears throat> so that's 62.85. So the answer is A. All right, number 44. This shape is made up of a rectangular prism, rectangular prism, and a pyramid. Find the total volume. Okay, I feel like I need to zoom in. So I'm going to call the, the pyramid on top volume number one. And I'm going to call the rectangular prism on the bottom volume number two. All right, so let's first find volume number one. Now, the volume of a pyramid is one-third the area of the base times the height. So what I like to do is off to the side, I find the area of the base. Um, well, the base of this pyramid is a rectangle. Well, in, in fact, more specifically, it's a square. Uh, I can tell because it's sitting right on top of this rectangular prism, and I see that's 5 by 5. So that means the base of this pyramid is this uh, square that's um, the length and width is 5. So the area of the base is 5 times 5, which is 25. Okay, so plugging that in, that tells me that volume number 1 is going to be 1 third 25. Um, hmm, be careful. The height of the pyramid is not 9. That's the height of the pyramid and the prism combined. Uh, so, if I need to cut this right here and figure out what the height is, um, well, this portion down here is 3. All right, I see we're giving the height off to the side. So that means this part up here must be 6 for a total of 9. So the height of the uh, pyramid is 6. And this will give me volume number 1. Um, that's going to come out to be 50. 1 third times 6 is 2. 2 times 25 is 50. So volume 1 is 50. All right, now let's switch colors and do volume 2. All right, the volume of a prism is the area of the base times the height. Um, the base is the same base that I just did for the pyramid. The base is 25. All right, so the volume of the prism is 25 times the height, which is 3. All right, so volume number 2 is 75. So the total volume is just going to be volume 1 plus volume 2. So that's going to be um, 125 uh, cubic units. Okay, so the answer is A. A cylinder with height 15 centimeters has a volume of 2,000 cubic centimeters. What is the cylinder's radius? Well, they're giving me the volume, so I think I will start off with the formula for the volume of a cylinder. The formula for the volume of a cylinder is the same as for a prism, and that is area of the base times the height. So the question is, um, what is the area of the base? Well, first of all, they gave me the volume, so I'm going to go ahead and, and substitute the 2,000 in for V. Um, now, the area of the base, if we're talking about a cylinder, so automatically, if you're dealing with a cylinder, all right, the base is a circle. So the area of the base is pi r squared, because that's the area of a circle. So we need to do pi r squared in place of uh, the area of the base. And then times the height. Well, the height is 15. OK, so it's pi r squared times 15, area of the base times the height. Um, so we're trying to find the radius. So we just need to solve this for r. So the next thing we need to do 
is divide both sides by 15 pi, because that will cancel out the 15 and the pi. So I'm going to divide by 15 pi. Okay, so be careful. Um, that's going to leave me with, so I've got 2,000 over 15 pi is equal to the radius squared. I know this is going to give me some decimal, and I still need to take the square root. So I prefer to leave it like this, and then knowing that for the final answer, I need to take the square root of both sides. So I'm just going to put it in like this. So if I do the square root of 2,000 <clears throat> over 15 pi, this should give me the answer. So 6.51 centimeters. So the answer is B. Okay, which diagram shows the correct construction of the perpendicular bisector of PQ? Well, when you do the perpendicular bisector, um, you take your compass and you put it at P and you go more than halfway and you draw an arc. And then you take your compass and you put it at Q and you go more than halfway and you draw another arc. And wherever they intersect, that's the perpendicular bisector. <clears throat> so as you can see as I'm pointing to this picture, this is the correct picture of a perpendicular bisector. Okay, a line through point P is constructed parallel um, to the bold line. What geometric principle justifies this conclusion? Well, it, it's all about corresponding angles, okay? What we really did was we copied the angle. We copied the first angle with the second angle. We duplicated it. And um, if corresponding angles are congruent, um, that means the, the lines <coughs> are parallel. So I'm going to look for the one that says something about corresponding angles. So let's see. And a pair of alternate interior angles? No. Exterior angles? No. Corresponding angles? Yes. Um, consecutive interior angles? No. <clears throat> so the answer is, is C. Now I'll go back and read it more carefully. If two lines are intersected by a transversal, all right, two lines, transversal, and a pair of corresponding angles are congruent, boom, boom, the lines are parallel. All right, that's a more formal way of saying what I just said. All right, guys, that's going to do it for this video. Go ahead and click here in the red apple to watch the next video. Click in the green apple to subscribe or click the yellow apple for the full playlist.